So welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Richard Beaver. I'm with Duke University. Um, I'm the, the CISO and assistant uh, CIO. And today uh, our team is going to be talking about the uh, a tool that we've been trialing called Proxyware. So this is about detecting malicious code in websites. Uh, we also want to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and we will be posting it on the Research SOC uh, YouTube channel at a later date. So as we get through the presentation, we do encourage you to use the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the presentation uh, and answer those. And so we're looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. And our host for today's webinar is the Research SOC. Research SOC is a package of services from Indiana University's OmniSOC that are tailored to meet the unique cybersecurity needs of NSF research facilities. Research SOC combines OmniSOC's 24 by 7 monitoring, vulnerability identification, decoy computers or honeypots, uh, dedicated project expertise, and other services to make NSF facilities resilient to cyber attacks and capable of supporting trustworthy uh, productive research. And for today's presentation, uh, I did want to introduce our team that will be speaking. We have Nico Bailey. Uh, Guggen Coer and Alex Merck from Duke University, and we're joined by Pat Siavalella from uh, the Media Trust, who is part of the team that, that put together Proxyware. So that being said, we'll go ahead and jump in. And today we're going to be talking about four different areas. We're going to be looking at the challenge that uh, malicious websites present. We'll be looking at some of the architecture and operations around how we're using a, a tool called Proxyware to, to uh, detect and, and respond to these types of, of attacks. We'll look at a case study. And finally, we'll look at some of the data and, and what it's telling us or what we're able to glean from this. So if we take a step back before we start looking at websites, you know, one of the questions we asked ourselves at the beginning of this is how do we typically defend against external attacks? And if you, you take a look at what we typically do, you know, we, we will start with the network. Okay, do we have a firewall in place? Do we have an intrusion prevention system? Uh, are we running intrusion detection to look at stuff inside the network? Uh, we may, you know, make use of DNS block lists uh, or other services of the, of the like. And we may look at using web proxy type services that would help us to uh, vet traffic or vet uh, sites that, that our users are visiting. Then we might look at the host and we might go, well, we wanna make sure that software updates are being applied you know, in a timely fashion. Uh, we might look at additional kind of host security measures like firewalls. Uh, we're definitely gonna be looking at antivirus or uh, EDR type solutions like CrowdStrike or, or Carbon Black. And then from a host or a user perspective, we're gonna be looking at how we lock down those accounts, whether it's using something like MFA and password management, or uh, we're, we're doing things with education and awareness to make sure that our users are up to date on the latest threats and, and challenges. But you know, it, as with all things, what attackers do, and we, we all kind of know this, they, as we get better at a particular defense, they rotate around to something different. And that kind of brings us into websites. So, you know, what, websites as a medium for an attack, have, it's always been somewhat popular and we can look at it, you know, starting with this idea of drive-by attacks, which, um, you know, the, this is when an attacker gains control of a website, they embed code in that website uh, and they entice somebody or, or just, you know, kind of target of opportunity. Somebody connects to that website and by virtue of interacting with it, they become infected or they're presented with fraudulent uh, options. Um, then we've got, you know, the kind of the next stage up is, well, great, if we can do drive-by attacks, well, what if we could target people? So what if we could target them 
by uh, saying, well, you know, you're coming to this website from a browser that appears to be running on a, a Mac OS machine and, and maybe it's a Safari, uh, the, the Safari browser and oh gee, maybe you're running a version that's slightly out of date that my malware can take advantage of so I can execute that against you versus, oh, this other person's visiting the same website and, um, and now the browser is, is Chrome and it's fully patched and therefore I'm not going to try to pass this malware to you. Uh, we can also do things like instead of trying to take over a particular website, would it be nice as an attacker if we could simply inject code into the website via some third party service? So think of ad networks, think of um, uh, you know, third party uh, source code or, or open source code that's added to the website that's delivering some content uh, in some ways, et cetera. So there are ways that we can get and inject code into websites that doesn't require us to take complete control of said website. And that, that becomes uh, interesting to us. So as, as an attacker, um, and then if we take, you know, kind of look at the attacker motivations, why do attackers do this? Well, <laughs> because they can, and their motivations range everywhere from kind of fraudulent, for example, can we get, can we uh, entice somebody to click on the link and go to another website so I can, I can uh, generate a microtransaction um, to the malicious, which great, I'm going to try to seed your connection or I'm going to try to use your connection to seed your machine with malware. Um, and this particularly at the beginning of 2020 or starting in 2020, this became something that was much more of a concern, right? We all sent people home. We all had people working remotely. And the question is, okay, we, we know that folks are gonna use their web browsers quite a bit, both for personal and business use. And how do we make sure that the websites that they're going to or that their computer systems are adequately protected so they're not impacted by this type of, of attack? Uh, if they were sitting on our campuses, we could do things with the firewalls, with IPSs, we could do things with DNS block lists. It's not as easy to do that when they're operating from their home on a remote connection or using a personal machine. And the last thing we kind of wanted to highlight here is that everything we're describing so far, it's about how an enterprise would respond to the threat or the risks posed by websites injecting or presenting malicious code to users visiting the website. But if you take a step back, wouldn't it be nice if the website operators themselves were a bit more on the ball looking at what's happening with their websites and saying, all right, well, it looks like uh, this third party code is being used to inject or add something into the, the stream of certain people that are visiting the site, gee, we should do something about that, right? So, I mean, just like we would hold ourselves accountable for cyber hygiene, how do we help the website operators hold themselves accountable for that? And that was kind of the landscape behind looking at what was out there. So back in 2019, um, cross-functional team at Duke. This was actually started by a professor in our uh, School of Public Policy, David Hoffman. He put together a research team over the summer with, with some students. And the idea here really started out as, do we understand what is happening with websites and what they are serving up? And could that, that data be used to help drive policy changes around how website operators um, secure their systems and, and to what uh, standard or how they are held accountable for this. And the goal of the project was, gee, could we set up an environment in which we could detect websites that are serving malicious code aimed or targeting Duke users? Could we stop those attacks? Could we inform the digital entities then uh, that are enabling the attackers, the website operators, if you will, could we inform them that, hey, you've got something bad going on here, can you please stop that? Can we look at 
at things that we can change to our infrastructure to understand and stop the potential impact of those attacks? And can we simplify attribution? And the the last one's pretty important to us because it's one thing to say, hey, you know what, CNN, you're, you're serving up uh, malware, so let's let's uh, stop you from doing that. But we don't want to block CNN, right? Or, or Fox or NBC or any of those, any of the, the news channels. But what we do want to do is make sure that the owners of those websites are doing the right things to take care and clean up those, those sites. Uh, we're going to get into this in just a second around the architecture piece itself, but really this is making use of a technology that all of us are familiar with. Can we use a proxy that's running in a, a virtual container and use that to set up a number of different browser profiles, right? You know, so some of them could be Firefox, some of them could be Chrome, some of them could be set up to mimic a Duke student, some of them could be set up to mimic uh, a Duke faculty member. And then can we have those profiles browse different websites, record the interaction, and see if we can gather information about unexpected interactions uh, everywhere from a compromise attempt uh, click fraud, phishing, and you'll see a few of these examples. Uh, cloaking, which is is hiding uh, hiding the actions that are, are trying to occur, um, all the way up through the malware injection through either a redirect or a, a install prompt. So, using these categories, can we start gathering data and information now that would allow us to categorize the attacks? that would allow us to um, do attribution and, and notify website owners of the issue that they're seeing, and then use that information to block subsequent attacks, whether it's through DNS block lists, whether it's through pushing down into our uh, host base tools, et cetera. And we think that there's a lot of positive things that we can do with this. And we're just at the beginning of, of the journey, so to speak. So with that being said, I want to turn this over to my colleagues, um, Alex Merck and Nico Bailey, and look a little bit at, at how this technology works. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about kind of the end goals of this solution, but kind of wanted to dig into some of the technical details about how all of this works, what's involved with getting this set up. So if you want to go to the next slide, Richard. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So there, there are kind of three components for the end user. First, uh, Nico is going to be demoing this a little bit later, but there is uh, a web UI so you can you know browse and see what type of activity you're seeing through the proxy on your own environment. So, you know, you can go in and see like, these are the things that were detected by the proxy using these certain profiles. Along with that, uh, there's also API integration. So all of the, the data that you can get from the UI, you can also query that in a, you know, scriptomatic fashion uh, to, to pull out that data, put it into, you know, any type of SIM or logging system that you're using, as well as, you know, potentially performing uh, blocks on some of these uh, domains that are hosting, you know, malicious content. And then the, the final component, which we'll get into a little bit in the next slide, is the, the proxy itself. So, you know, running a system that is going to be taking uh, the scans that the Media Trust runs and then you know, using that to emulate uh, browsing activity from your network, uh, emulating a, you know, specific user, whether it's, you know, an end user, faculty, staff, researcher. And I'll pass it over to Pat to kind of talk about the, the Proxyware platform and kind of what all happens on the back end. Thanks, Alex. So the Media Trust platform was primarily used to focus on identifying any third-party code that could either be malicious, suspicious, or even just unauthorized to be running by the website owners. 
So we started in the advertising ecosystem as the beginning steps. But as we started to grow as a company, the attack surface began to grow. So we started utilizing multiple different ways to identify each threat. It all starts with our core database, which is going to execute the different types of scanning, whether it's from mobile web, mobile app, desktop, or direct integrations from our clients. We will execute those scans and confirm if there's any sort of indicators that are being identified in those scans that take place. So as the security department gets presented with new indicators that could potentially be malicious, it's going to allow us to continue to utilize our AI and machine learning to hone in on the true positives, to make sure that as these new indicators are identified, my department's running through, we're editing and tweaking anything that's producing a false positive to make sure that the indicators that are getting identified by our analysis process are going to present us with any malicious threats that could be occurring. Great, thanks, Pat. Uh, so, you know, from the, the actual proxy system standpoint, uh, there isn't a whole lot involved with this. Uh, essentially, you know, the the solution requires a Linux server running in your environment within your network. Uh, the system creates a secure SSH reverse tunnel back to uh, the Media Trust scanning platform. And at that point, once that uh, reverse tunnel is created and set up, uh, then they can go ahead and start scanning sites or browsing to sites using this proxy you know, on behalf of your environment, your users. Um, so, you know, this is a great way to get around firewall restrictions uh, that may be in place to, you know, allow this type of scanning uh, in your environment. Um, and they're also, you know, scanning over 700 unique locations around the globe. Um, so, you know, casting a wide net for any of this, you know, malicious content that may be hosted on the web and targeting your environment. So for our instance here at Duke, um, we're currently running it on a two CPU, four gigabyte uh, Linux virtual machine. Uh, you could definitely run it with a lot fewer resources. Essentially all it's doing is creating a reverse SSH tunnel back to their system. Uh, the overall setup of that platform on our end took, I would say less than 30 minutes. It was, you know, very painless process, uh, essentially just creating a new user account, uh, copying over some SSH keys, and then setting up a, a bash script to run, uh, I believe via system D, um, so that that would grant access to that system from their scanning platform. Um, there are a couple of considerations uh, with the platform uh, that we've seen on our end. So it does generate a lot of traffic, um, doing traffic analysis on various IP addresses uh, within our network. It's regularly in the kind of top of our top talkers on campus. Um, also, we have seen instances when, you know, a site is hit that is hosting a malicious advertisement or malicious content. Sometimes we'll get alerts on our end um, identifying, you know, via our IPS IDS that um, we've seen some malicious traffic uh, coming to or from that host. Uh, so something to keep in mind as well um, as you're running this, uh, you know, nothing is targeting the system directly, but it may show up if you're, you know, doing these types of detections. Um, and then finally, uh, Media Trust also has a Raspberry Pi version that you can deploy in your own home. Several of us are running it uh, here at Duke, but kind of cast that net a little wider, uh, looking for you know uh, sites that are targeting users on specific uh, internet providers. And I will pass it over to Nico now. 
Thanks, Alex. Um, so yeah, as Alex mentioned earlier, I'll be giving a, a quick demo of uh, what the what the dashboard looks like. Uh, here you can tell it's run on the using the Zendesk uh, CRM platform. It's really clean, really simple to use. It, um, it kind of makes the tool you know really easy to look at. Uh, you also see an example of one of the um, digests that we get daily. They package up all your alerts for a day and uh, the TMT, TMT will send us a, an email digest so we can kind of get a, a, visibil a, a get visibility into what alerts we had for that day, um, you know, without having to really log into the, the platform and take much action. Uh, and they handle all notifications out to publishers which allows us to, you know, kind of be, be hands off there. We do, you know, we run through that initial setup as Alex covered and then everything kind of does all the scanning and, you know, when it identifies malicious stuff, um, the media trust folks will reach out to publishers and, you know, let them know what was identified, where it was identified, and we'll just get a look at that data. Um, if you look at that next slide, Richard, uh, we'll get a, a quick look at what that email digest looks like. Uh, and this is the same thing that you're going to see inside the dashboard itself. Um, but these, like I said, they just digest them all up into one easy email to look at daily. And let me see if I can share my screen here. All right. Uh, so again, this is pretty much the same thing you saw on the screenshot here. You can see that we have multiple detections daily. It's constantly doing scanning and actively looking for things. Um, so we see lots and lots of stuff here. I've got a few uh, test tickets for us to look at here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things you want to pay attention to here is the attack type. Um, here we'll see the ones that we're looking at are all attack type malicious. And what the attack type malicious means is that this, this type of threat has consistently been identified redirecting to various locations and ending in some level of malware for the targeted user here. Uh, the other bit you'll see here is the attack type, attack source type. Uh, in this case is a code segment, but usually the attack source type will either be the site uh, or URL where the issue was identified originally, or in the case of code segment, as we see here, it's when the actual code that's supposed to be put onto a web page to deliver uh, an ad is scanned before the website is um, public, before it goes live on the public website, rather. Um, and so this first ticket here, we're, we're looking at uh, an instance that it identified of the linker malware. And what the linker malware does is it identifies, um, or excuse me, it injects malicious code into uh, Google Chrome browser extensions. Uh, using that same JavaScript, an attacker can uh, track a user's browsing history. Uh, they can replace legitimate ads with their own ads, uh, redirecting that revenue elsewhere, um, and even you know redirecting to further malicious content for that targeted user. Uh, the next ticket we're looking at here is for um, a software install prompt or a pup uh, PUP, which is just potentially an unwanted program. Uh, these are advertisements and pop-ups that prompt users to download and install software or extensions that have been repackaged to include other malicious uh, malicious software. And so, you know, think of it as in, you know, when you go and download um, Adobe or something, and then it'd be like, hey, you know, here's all these checkboxes to download five other pieces of software um, that would go along with those. Uh, and so that's what this example is. Um, if we look at our next ticket here, we're looking at um, a phishing uh, a phishing attack here. And essentially this one was identified, uh, the, there was a domain identified inside of an ad on this page that is known as a phishing domain that regularly has, you know, part landing pages for uh, users to fall, fall victim to. Uh, chances are, this content here is most likely a generic attack, uh, you know, in the form of, you know, insurance or, you know, hey, let's look for a dentist in your area, right? Uh, and users who fall for this then become susceptible to more targeted attacks. You know, once they filled in their information, they open themselves up to uh, being the victim of more attacks after this, uh, from this rather. And then looking at our last one here, uh, this one's interesting, but this one is uh, impression fraud. And so in this case, uh, impression fraud is 
meant to make single a single ad delivery impression into many ad delivery impressions. Uh, this type of attack will usually stack multiple full web pages web pages into a single tracking pixel or an iframe on the page where it's being loaded. And aside from all the you know malicious, potentially malicious ads generate generated from this, uh, it also causes issues for the the victim here um you know that could be browser slowdowns because your your browser is now you know requiring a lot more resources and even system level crashes um but yeah that's just a, a general look at kind of some of the stuff that's in here and as alex covered earlier you know what's really good is all those data can be pulled out by the api and then used to script and use in in many fashions as you know as it fits your needs okay Give me one second and I'll reshare. Okay, so uh, I think Pat now is going to walk us through a, a quick overview of one of the types of attacks that they've seen uh, regarding a, a player called Ghost Cap. Yes, thank you, Richard and Nico. I will go into a little more detail around what Nico was showing and displaying on screen. So most users are aware that malicious code is injected via the advertising ecosystem, but most people are unaware just how frequently this occurs. As you saw from Nico's screen share, you can see that just as a Duke profile, they're getting multiple attacks every single day. We are monitoring thousands of different attack vectors taking place on a daily basis. And it's, it's just a quick, easy way for malicious actors to launch their malicious content to a wide variety of users at a very rapid pace. So the first one that I wanted to go over was uh, software install prompts, which is what we're looking at now. Most of these are considered drive-by attacks because a user will visit a website, it's going to prompt them that a piece of software is outdated. This most of the time gets overlooked and most people don't really think twice about it, but oftentimes people are going to think that they need to update whatever piece of software it was and executing that content is going to open up their machine for different activities to take place. Usually they're going to install different backdoors, which will allow them to launch further attacks, whether it's going to be against the machine itself or try to get into whatever network that individual is actually on. And these could range from just different uh, phishing attacks to ransomware, and lots of different malicious content has been seen executed from basic attack vectors like this. So the next one I wanted to go over is one of the more sophisticated threat groups. This one we have named Ghost Cat. So I'm sure people out there have seen these type of pop-ups occur on their mobile device or their desktop saying, you've won X, Y, Z, click here, enter your information and we'll send you whatever it might be. Some of these are far less benign than others. This particular threat actor is very sophisticated and uses multiple layers of obfuscation to ensure that they utilize the advertising ecosystem to its fullest potential. Meaning they will launch different campaigns based upon what the user is actually viewing the content from. So the advertising ecosystem allows you to get extremely hyper-targeting down to device IDs, but more often it's simply used to identify what type of device they're using, what uh, version is it, to make sure that the malicious actor can launch that malicious version when the correct criteria is met. So this malicious actor will utilize two different styles for delivery payloads. The first is going to be a phishing campaign similar to what you're seeing on the screen. The more sophisticated ones are when you're using a susceptible Android device, they will actually launch their Trojans in the background of this. So 
These ones obviously don't require human interaction. They will execute onto the device, which then means that malicious actor has now gained your device itself. So it's definitely a location where malicious actors are taking advantage of that often gets overlooked by most SOC teams. So as a user visits a website, they don't even have to interact with most things before some sort of malicious content is going to execute. And again, this leads all the way back to ransomware attacks that come through via the standard channels where most people are paying more attention, whether it's through email or spear phishing attacks. Those ones are definitely being looked at and taken care of quicker, but the same type of malicious content will be executed from just visiting websites through third-party code, whether that's advertising or just tracking content and fingerprinting code that is on almost every single website that's out there today. Okay. And uh, Duggan, we want to talk a little bit about the data that we're seeing. Yes, um, thanks, Richard. So um, this, um, so we've gathered uh, a lot of data over the, uh, the past two years of this project, and this data is coming from agents uh, that are running on both uh, Duke network as well as some work from home networks. Um, so in the, from Duke's infrastructure, we have you know these agents are typically Linux VMs. Um, whereas um, on remote work from home networks uh, and commercial ISPs, we have Raspberry Pis. Um, so overall, um, from January 2021 to December 2021, we captured 25 million total scans uh, that were coming from 50,000 unique incidents. Uh, and it was observed across all the networks, both Duke and at-home devices. If you closely look at the chart, in blue, we have total scans. And you can see that there's a general decrease in the trend of uh, you know, total, monthly total scans from October 2020 to December 2021. Whereas in orange, uh, the unique incidents almost remain constant um, across different months. And uh, there's a spike from um, in the month of June and July. And we'll take a look at uh, why the reason behind uh, the spike um, in, in the next few slides. But this general decrease in total scans is um, very consistent with uh, the global spam volume that was reported by uh, Statista. And it seems like uh, the global spam volumes have been decreasing over the years since 2015. And it has been attributed to, you know, more awareness, more cybersecurity awareness and, you know, action against botnets. Uh, next slide. Well, no, to go. Uh, thanks. So uh, this slide, uh, let's look at the breakdown of total scans across different networks, because that's that actually gives us an interesting trend. So in blue, we've got uh, the blue line is for Duke, and the other three colors are, are work from home networks. Now, if you look at uh, in the month of March, there's an increase in scanning activity at Duke, whereas a decrease uh, across all of our work from home setups. And if you look at the trends uh, across all the months, uh, it seems like work uh, the activity at work from home networks is correlated, you know, they increase or decrease together. Whereas at Duke, the scan activity does not follow the same trend. That, you know, indicates that scanning activity is dependent on your uh, landscape um, and particularly, your, you know, what network we are talking about. Um, thank you. Uh, we can also break down 
the scans uh, by different attack vectors. And we saw these attack act, uh, vectors previously, you know, each scanning activity gets tagged as um, uh, into an existing attack vector based on uh, Proxivis database. So in terms of uh, incident categories, we see highest number of uh, software installed prompts. That's a top um, category for all, from all the scans. Uh, and the second is malicious redirects. Um, thank you. So in this slide, um, the graph is showing um, the breakdown of scans now by uh, the type of incident. And uh, you can see, again, there's a general increase uh, in the spamming, uh, in the scanning volume in the month of June and July, with a particular increase in the orange line, which is uh, the scam activity. And this can be, this is verified from, uh, again, uh, Statista that reported um, in the line below, you can see that between October and September 2021, global spam volume reached its highest point in July 2021. And uh, then we saw a slight increase in August uh, following September to the end of December. So uh, we see, you know, uh, in terms of the attacks and all the scans that we've captured, we see um, that it's very, very correlated with uh, global activity. And, um, and the most, uh, actually, uh, most of these, uh, the data that's reported by Statista is also um, uh, more, uh, the data is coming from United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a huge correlation between um, what we've captured from our networks to what we've seen, uh, to what other trends reported uh, by other um, cybersecurity companies. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so with that, um, we're going to we're going to stop the presentation here and open it up to to questions. I, I just want to close. I want to thank uh, Chris and the team for their help with this. One, this was a very impactful project in terms of, of being a, a really great intersection between um, a, a company developing a product between a security uh, team from an operational perspective, but also in partnering with our faculty and students on an effort to kind of apply the technology to helping address, in this case, a, a policy question or challenge. And uh, so, so that was a really um, interesting, I think, experiment and in a very uh, a very good project that, that we were able to work on. And, you know, just as, as this goes ahead, if there are questions about it, obviously uh, the, the folks here at Duke, we're, we're happy to answer any questions you all might have about it. Uh, and then if you want to talk to uh, Pat and Chris Olson and the rest of the team that, that worked on this, this product, uh, we put the email address in the, the slide deck there for it. And with that, uh, let's see, let's see, C. Davis asks, what is the cost and ease of setup for the Raspberry Pi devices? Um, I can speak to the ease of setup. It was really simple. Uh, they, they mailed us a couple of Raspberry Pi devices, but it, in all seriousness, Pat, I, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Sure. So the device itself is very simple to set up. It's pretty much a plug and play. So as long as you hook it up and it has proper internet connection, it's basically as simple as that. As far as the cost goes, you can reach out to the Media Trust directly. We'll be happy to elaborate more on that. Uh, let's see, anonymous attendee asks, how does the service, 
initiate user behavior when doing a scan? Yeah, I can definitely explain that a little bit. So our, our basic method for imitating users is going to be generating different cookie profiles based upon the average activity of that type of user. So we will build out certain cookie profiles and basically build up a user profile from that. And we will incorporate that into our scanning. So as we open a browser, we'll put in all of those cookies to make sure that the advertising companies will actually be able to identify our cookie structure and then target the correct advertisements based upon the user profile itself that we're utilizing. Yeah, I, I think, uh, hi, hi guys, this is Chris Olson. Um, uh, to, to, to add to that, the, the actual initiation of a scan, um, uh, the media trust, the, the core product that's, that's not proxyware is helping companies not harm you, right? So we work with Amazon and Microsoft and um, uh, Samsung, large, large media companies, large kind of advertising and marketing technology companies, and then the, the device manufacturers to help them understand what they're serving out. And so we have a scheduling mechanism that runs billions of, of for, for all intents and purposes, scans or transactions um, per month. Proxyware, uh, it becomes part of that. So when we become you, which is to see the, the attacks that are targeting you specifically, because um, targeting is that literal, it will, it will target a specific campus or person or corporation or, or institution, um, uh, that becomes part of that scheduler. And so uh, you become, as, as Pat's mentioning, this kind of end persona, which is a combination of your physical geography. So the, the IP of, of your university network or with the Raspi, it could, could be at home. Um, and then uh, if, if we're creating a profile to be a student or a faculty member, you know, it's really the proclivities that make sense out to the um, digital ecosystem. So they perceive you to be that. So hopefully that, that helps round that out. And then the actual initiation scheduling is something that is determined um, uh, based on how we set you up from a frequency of scan perspective. Thanks, Chris. And Jerry asked, detecting is interesting, but what is Duke doing with this information to make staff student browsing safer? Yeah, that's a great question. I, so here, here's our plan on this, Jerry, and we've done some of this. There, the, the nice thing about this tool, there is an API in it, so we can pull data um, and feed that into our threat intelligence list for blocking things like that. That's not something we have fully fleshed out yet, uh, we think that that is less intrusive than pushing um, faculty, staff, and students through proxy-like services to that that are more in kind of an allow block mode uh, for access to things. But you know, as we pointed out at the beginning of this, that that really using the data and feeding DNS block lists or feeding IPSs or feeding heck, feeding uh, tools that are on the hosts themselves, it's going to have limited positive impact on people that are, are you know, working from home and not coming in through the VPN, things like that. So I, I will tell you, and, and Alex and Nico, you all can jump in and, and correct anything I misstated or add to that. But to me, that is, that's kind of, what would be important to me, right, is how we can take the information, how we can get that down so that people that are working from home or working remotely are able to take advantage of that information, never, never come across it or see it. Yep, 100% agree, Richard. And frankly, Jerry, th this is something that, that that is concerning to me just in the consumer space, right? Because if you think about it, we're all working from home and we're all depending on our ISPs to be to provide that intelligence, to provide that security, et cetera. And, you know, we all kind of know that um, all ISPs are not created equal. 
And uh, so, you know, that, that's why we end up resorting to, you know, some of us putting in PF sense in our, uh, at our home or putting in firewall or something like that. And we also know that these are not things that the average consumer is going to be able to do or using services like open DNS or umbrella, I think is what it is now. All right. Any other questions from folks? Going once, twice. All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for your time this afternoon. Hopefully this was of interest and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or would like to try it out yourself. Okay. Thanks everybody.